Hey there, I'm Una, and I'm a unicorn. And do you know what unicorns are bad at? Booking meetings. Except for me, of course. My secret? I use Cirrus Insight to schedule all my meetings. That's Cirrus, spelled C-I-R-R-U-S, Cirrus Insight. Cirrus Insight takes all the hassle out of booking and scheduling my meetings, cutting the amount of steps involved to half, if not more. Now, instead of a 43-message deep email thread where everyone's trying to find the right time to meet, I can just send them to a link on my calendar page. From there, anyone who wants to meet with me can see when I'm available and schedule a meeting. It's magic, like me. And I should know a thing or two about magic. I'm a unicorn after all. But wait, there's more. Do you use Salesforce? If you do, Cirrus Insight can also remove most of the manual data entry involved with updating and maintaining your Salesforce environment. To learn more and start your 14-day free trial, visit CirrusInsight.com. That's Cirrus, spelled C-I-R-R-U-S, CirrusInsight.com. And tell them Una sent you. Hello, everyone. I'm your host and Salesforce MVP, Christy Campbell. Joining me on the show today is Emily Jensen, a fellow accidental admin in a new role as business analyst at Cash App. You can find her on the SFXD Discord as Eekers. Today, we're going to talk about the decision to build versus buy. So stay tuned. Hello, and welcome to Serious Insights. My name is Christy Campbell, and I'll be your host. I am the admin tech at Serious Insight. And uh, joining me today is Emily Jensen, who is the Director of Sales Operations at Infrascale. Also, I know wears many hats and uh, describes herself as being known for empowering others, excellent attention to detail, and her love of ambitious projects, which is a great segue into our topic today. So hello, Emily. Hello, Christy. Thank you for joining us. So um, good to if be ever I do slip up and refer to you as Eekers, I think you will still reply. Um, yes. Emily and I <laughs> know each other from the uh, Salesforce Discord community. And um, she had made some comments about different projects along the way. And so when we started talking about topics for the show, uh, this one, we wanted to talk about build versus buy. So um, you've got, you know, a new project coming up. And I think this for any admin architect becomes the question, right? Do you want to build something or is there something you can buy? Combination of each. So um, we wanted to talk through that a little bit. You maybe want to give some insight as to um, why I all those hats you wear and or why I thought you might be a good person to talk to about this one. <laughs> um so uh do you want to hear about the hats or why the hats sure. both all <laughs> oh okay um uh i wear uh, a number of hats um i co i'm a co-admin for salesforce i also work on a number of integrations for different systems into salesforce and with salesforce um i primarily started with the sales team as a sales development rep about seven years ago mm -hmm. and um or business development rep, my, I'm sorry, and then kind of worked into sales ops and became an accidental admin at the same time. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, kind of started taking over more of the sales operations side of Salesforce administration for the company, whereas my co-admin took over more marketing operations. Okay. Um, in the last year, I moved into the finance department and so I've also started working on a lot of billing operations and also helping the co-admin with um, marketing operations. And now we kind of just sort of like trade tasks, you know, whatever, whoever has the the nearest skill set or the time. The whole rev so that cycle. helps with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I still kind of focus more on sales operations and the business processes than he does, but I do wear more hats within the organization for different departments than I used to, which is exciting. And I think it really is worthwhile for people who um, do have a lot of business systems and do have a lot of integrations into Salesforce to being aware of the different uh, departments, business processes, and what their needs might be for Salesforce to fulfill on, for the systems to fulfill on, um, for the entire business. I think that having a holistic approach is is good, very beneficial, and at least that's what we've we've seen over the last year of things shifting and p 
people moving around in the organization a little bit more. Um, and it's exciting. Uh, I really, really enjoy working on so many different products and so many different departments because it Do informs each that? other. Yeah. And digging into all the problems and trying to right. make things better. I like, think, go ahead. Yeah. Like sales operations, I mean, it doesn't exist without, like sales operations and billing operations, they go really hand in hand. You know, sales mm -hmm. ops has to know how billing ops needs things so that they can process the opportunities that get booked, that so right. they can process the, you know, products that get sold. It needs to understand fulfillment operations so that sales operations can support fulfillment operations and all of that. So that's, it's always been helpful. For, yeah. for my position. And I think too, that um, kind of ties into this conversation in terms of really before you can even approach a build or buy conversation, I think that, you know, the idea of asking why five times and really digging into those requirements and, and really understanding that business process um, is, is a key part of it. Because I think it's easy to hear one thing and be like, oh, I can build that, right? Or, oh, I, I just saw this, a demo jam with this app that can do that. And then to potentially get caught up in other features and other things, but really trying to understand the core of the problem you're trying to solve before you even, you know, start trying to solve it, which seems obvious, right. but isn't always the way it goes. I know, right. It seems really obvious, but um, I think having a strong approach is the hardest part. You know, you can, you can ask why is a lot. You can, you can, um, you can adopt different methodologies, but finding the right methodology that works for the people in your business works for you. Um, either if as a Salesforce admin, as a Salesforce architect, as a Salesforce developer, um, that's going to be key to your success. Yeah, for sure. And, um, and I think part of it too is understanding what things are essential, like what things are, it is only a hundred percent fit acceptable for your solution or is right. it kind of, is there a good enough for now, like moving things forward kind of um, angle or is a lot of, you know, there's one key need, but a lot of nice to haves that kind of what you were right. saying of it, does it make it easier for finance, even if it maybe does the salesperson isn't the one that cares, cares about that feature in the, you know, on the front end? Yeah, <laughs> that's a really good point. Um, and that's such an interesting balance, right? Like you have different philosophies um, in leadership and those philosophies and how they see the systems can really impact how the users um leverage the systems, right? So, um, for example, at one point we tried to make Salesforce the, you know, center of our, of our system hub. Everything okay. went to Salesforce. Salesforce was kind of the, um, final destination for the majority of the data. Um, but that wasn't always true. We still had data that was living in different receptacles and different types of databases that were homegrown or otherwise. And um, those other departments didn't necessarily want that data moving into Salesforce. Now, um, it was a it was a decent philosophy, and I think it's a philosophy that a lot of other businesses utilize. Um, but at the time that this philosophy was occurring, uh, maybe three or four years ago, uh, they weren't willing to invest in additional um, integrations or system mm -hmm. updates to Salesforce in order to um, properly uh, enable Salesforce to be the center of the data okay. um, for the business, <laughs> which which it, it ultimately made it very difficult to do reporting because um, finance would count on Salesforce being incredibly accurate for its billing operations right. and um, so on and so forth, or for due diligence rounds with uh, financing. So that was an interesting place to be. And that really is kind of where the whole um, build versus buy situation for me started, where I had to start um, leveraging Salesforce, leveraging standard or custom objects in really unique ways in order to, um, in order to fulfill on certain business requirements, because 
they weren't willing to invest budget in into new systems or into um, app exchange products or add-ons. I think it's a, it's interesting too to think about. Um, I think it's more the budget feels like a straightforward thing, right? Like, do we have budget to buy this tool that could solve, you know, is this magic thing that could solve all our problems? But um, Mm -hmm. also like, what's the opportunity cost or or really the, the salary related cost of not doing that, right? Like if the, even if you have the resources of people who have the knowledge you need, what, does their time cost to come up with workarounds or like you say, to, to do things manually or to like the, the trade-off I think doesn't always get the, the credit it's due right. For um, an alternative to buying something. Right. There's a lot of different resources in the question, right? Like there's time resources. Does your admin have time to, um, spec a new solution? Does your admin have time to research the variety of solutions that are out there for the business need? Does your admin have time to install it and then train users to use it? Um, for me, the training of users was such a big part of the equation mm. that a lot of the time um, when I was considering do I build it or do I buy it, um, I would lay very heavily in the, do I have to train people to use it (laughs) column, how much work that would be. Because, you know, when you have, when you're in sales operations and you're an admin, I think that you're wearing, you're wearing two very similar, but they're definitely two very different hats. Mm -hmm. You have sales operations, which is very user-based, very sales focused, very sales driven, you know, sales want sales ops to be available to help them deal desk, to help them configure opportunities, configure quoting, whatever. And they and then sales administration, you also have the other departments behind you asking for assistance. Right. So when you have that, you kind of have a conflict of fires, right? <laughs> and then you add in user training into that conflict of fires or that confluence of fires. And you're like, oh boy. How much do I have to spend on the phone training sales or reinforcing training with sales? And is that worth my time? Right. So uh, I think, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, and then sometimes I think the idea that, you know, you buy a tool that has training baked in or as part of an implementation package, but there's still an aspect of like, yes, certainly throughout the implementation that's either your admin's time, your end users, a lot of time to get to that point. You've still got someone that's training that isn't a part of your business. So there's certain, or maybe I'm just a control freak, um, but right. there's certain caveats, right? Where no, it's like, we do, you know, we have you do this training and then I turn around and translate it. Or then I get similar questions because it's more of a generic training versus geared to us. You know, it sounded like a good right. idea, but it's not necessary or when they actually go to do the thing and ours looks different, then it feels like the training falls apart. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so interesting that you mentioned the looks different part of that because (laughs) I, you know, getting hung up on user interface uh, differences is a huge issue. I think for human beings in general, And um, this is why smartphones, you know, when you switch from an iPhone to an Android, you're like, what do I do? What is this alien technology? (laughs) You know, who are you? And why are you making this noise? And why are you giving me this notification? And I don't understand where to look for anything. Right. And then, um, and it's the same if you're, you know, moving between different operating systems or what have you. If your trainer or on the solution has just something, something just is slightly different. The contact page layout in Lightning looks different. You know, columns are in different places. The phone number isn't in the same place or an email is, you know, slightly off to a different direction. And someone's been trained to look in the upper left-hand corner for specific information. 
Hmm. you're going to have to do a retraining, like you just said. It's so, it's so interesting how little things are such gotchas. Um, well, and especially for your salespeople, like you mentioned, they're, you don't want them to have to think about those things. Exactly. You know, like you're trying to make a smooth process for like literally sales enablement, right. To enable them to sell the things, to keep mm-hmm. the lights on, you know, and to try and make things easier. But sometimes the change itself feels hard, whether, yeah. w- whether it's your training or not. I mean, I probably over explain things sometimes. Right. So, um, mm because I'm thinking about all those little background things that matter to me that maybe don't matter to my users. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good point. Like getting into admin nitty gritty stuff where they're, where you're like, well, this object does this and then you gotta have this over here for this reason. I had to do it this way because, and they're like, I don't really care. (laughs) (laughs) Come on. This is the fun stuff. (laughs) <laughs> um, and you're like, this is how I stay engaged in this right? training. <laughs> I have to think about it. <laughs> I'm reminding myself why I did it this hard way because that, you know, <laughs> sales reasons. Right. Um, right. <laughs> but I think the other thing that's interesting to think about is, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, knowing your business and your specific requirements, but I do think it's good to take a step back and, and really remember Uh, someone's probably done it before, right? Like very few issues in the end, the broad strokes of what we're trying to do and support with the CRM, especially in sales cloud, I think are pretty consistent. So um, I definitely think that there's value in seeing either a product that is available or something, a blog, a video or something of a walkthrough of what someone has done. Um, just to see really to get a sense of how hard it might be or easy it might be to make. Right. Yeah. I think that's actually, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, although then, then it's also sometimes easy to start somewhere, but then as the complexity grows, right. Either once you kind of start down a path, you've kind of got to think about the future of if they're going to start asking more things and then I've got more things I need to build or if I buy something oh my god yeah can I grow it into scale? it and then I'm <laughs> yeah and then I'm I'm susceptible to their feature release you know kind of questions I feel like for some mm-hmm. reason I feel like sometimes with implementing new things I'm like the the roadmap builder finder where I'm like can you do this and they're like nope but that's a great idea it's like well, okay <laughs> So let's you're like uh, you're out a different way. (laughs) Um, So um, yeah, sorry, I had interrupted. I think you had a thought about no, no worries. You're 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 not as unique as you think. Maybe kind of sometimes. Yeah, I think it's interesting, right? And that's where um, being parts of a community or like being good at googling (laughs) comes into um, a strong focus. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know that Google. Wow. Um, but uh, I, I think so. It's some some background. Here's a, so here's a story about something that I built without looking it up, if that's interesting. So you got to yeah. give some hot goss here. <laughs> and guess what? I built it all in process builder. So like oh. mea culpa. These are my sins. Um <laughs> <laughs> hey, it could have been workflow rules. Oh boy, those there were some too, <laughs> but not so many. I have always hated workflow rules. Um, and they 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 serve a purpose, but very sure. very infrequently. Um, so, uh, it was 2016, and I had, I think, very recently received admin access, mm, like the power. Mm, the power. No, it was 2017. It was a year after I received admin access. And um, previously, before I had done that, I would like just write these really long spec emails. Like I had done a bunch of research. I'd built this idea in my head of what I needed. Um, and then I would send them to the the guy who is now my co-admin. And he would 
eventually just lost patience was like just build it yourself just you know what you're doing it's I, a sandbox. I think you know here you go and um so 2017 and i discovered process builder and i was like gung-ho i'm gonna automate how to uh, i'm gonna automate upgrades and renewals like mm-hmm. i'm gonna automate the renewal opportunity i'm going to um you know create pipeline in the future for this renewal and i think I spent like six or seven hours in one of our conference rooms at our old LA office and I wrote it all out on a whiteboard. Okay. The Love tiniest it. little handwriting too. I have a picture. It's hilarious. Maybe we'll include it in, you know, show notes <laughs> or something. But um, it had everything around like what kind of downstream processes this will entail, you know, what is needed on an, on a renewal opportunity, how are these going to relate to the opportunity itself? And, you know, really looking back, like, I wish I had architected it differently. I wish I had started with a different object as the primary, like, keeper of all opportunities, you know, maybe a contract or whatever. And, and that's, that's fun to reflect on, but I didn't Google a dang thing. Like I didn't look up, did anybody do this before? I didn't (laughs) like, no way. I was just like, I'm going to just do it. Yeah. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna gung ho into it. And man, I really wish I hadn't because (laughs) about, yeah, well, so the, the funny thing about Process Builder and things you, that you learn later is you can't debug in Process Builder. So you just have to activate it and pray. Yay. And so you activate it and then you start you start praying and um, it fails and you're like, oh, God, why did it fail? So you, you spend a lot of time when you don't do research into did somebody do this before I did it? Mm in in finding the little bugs and finding the little gotchas for me it was i really had to accelerate what i knew about automation in salesforce within the span of a few weeks Mm -hmm. and um not a lot of people have the luxury of that kind of time Mm. you know to figure out errors fortunately the company was in a position and i was in a position where i could experiment like that Mm -hmm. but I don't think a lot of admins get to do that. I think right. that by hooking into, all right, what are the limitations of process builder? Or, you know, what's going to happen if I create race conditions in process builder? How many how many versions is that going to take for me to figure out? For me, it was about 17 versions. <laughs> so I don't recommend it. <laughs> now well, and is, it, is it out of curiosity? Google. Is it something that's still in use today? Did you end up, did it end up working eventually and you kept it? It was until last year. Wow. See, I, so it's like. It's, I know it was actually quite good. <laughs> it's an interesting balance. Be- it, it, it's funny because that's literally something I'm, a project I'm working on right now is the idea. So mm-hmm. what we're doing right now for renewal opportunities isn't really robust enough. It's not, we don't have a great sense of like you said, kind of a contract record, something in the middle that's really telling me what you have right now that then helps make sure that your upsells and renewals just really stay tight, right? We can get there, Mm -hmm. but it's just a little harder. So, um, you know, do do I want to build something where I think I know what we need and I can see what we have, which is working okay, right? It's good enough, um, but I think could be better. Or do we look at um, a tool of somebody that has built something and seen other customers and what they're doing for SaaS products with, um, you know, subscriptions, which Salesforce isn't exactly built for and um, kind of- Yeah, not natively. Almost like stand on the shoulders of giants, right? That already, like Mm -hmm. they've already thought of all the things I haven't thought of, of the number of decimal points of rounding and then, you know, just one-time products versus- Gosh, I hate that. (laughs) Subscription products versus like tiered products, you know, like just all the different um, kinds of pieces. And again, not just what we're doing today, but, you know, oh, now we want to introduce a new product that, um, or we want to introduce um, a training that's a flat fee, right? So how does that fit into 
when everything else is subscription, you know, thinking through all those things. Right. And do we want to um, bring in something where, you know, and, and then partner selection becomes a big part of it too, right? If you've got the um, got channel stuff going on. Yeah. And, and, and certain tools, right. Even Salesforce does releases three times a year. So, and, and there's, Mm -hmm. you know, plenty of prioritization and all that. So depending on the size of partner you're working with, if you do, you know, make a suggestion or need a feature, then how long might that take to get? um, Right. And, and can you work around it is, which again, goes back to kind of where we started of really having your requirements defined, like I must be able to do this. Um, And then if it's just kind of a nice to have, then maybe you can wait a little while. Um, Yeah, no. And I mean, it's, so it's interesting. And like you and I have talked about this before personally um, about, you know, renewal opportunities and how do you do it. And like, I really did actually, after you first asked me that question, I think it was back in July or something. I spent a while, you know, really collecting my thoughts about it. Like, what is it that needs to happen? And um, I wrote a pretty good, a pretty good blog post on it that I think I'll share with you later um, about really that you have to have a strong architecture, architecture philosophy before you implement things that have object creation based um specifications i think Mm -hmm. like if the architecture philosophy is there like it makes sense then you don't really need to develop one but in the case of renewals and subscription based renewals um and upgrades i think that salesforce does not inherently have that Mm -hmm. now if you go and you sign up for a dev org on salesforce.com today you'll have access to one of their newer features called salesforce billing which is very interesting and something that, I mean, basically having a dev org caused me to ask my account executive about. Um, So that's kind of another buy versus build situation. Do I want to look into Salesforce billing so that I can have better um, contract, uh, native contract functionality? Because it basically increases the functionality on the contract object and adds line items to the contract which is okay. just oh, of course. sweet if you ask me. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, that also is another like con- pro-con conversation. Are you using a billing system that syncs back to Salesforce natively? Like, mm-hmm. um, for example, my company uses Zora and we have CPQ and Zora 360 sync. Whew. So that enables us to push with CPQ and Zora, and it pulls data through the 360 sync. Um, that ha- that creates a subscription object with subscription line items. Um, but then there's the conversation of what's your Zora architecture like? Are mm. these products coming back in a way that makes sense to a user? Um, so last year, I w- embarked on a Zora architecture rebuilt re-architecture of the catalog Ooh, fun. Um, where <laughs> our products didn't make much sense because they were built with the architecture concept in mind of them representing product families. So you had a different product family for X, Y, Z, and they'd sync back as a product two object in Salesforce mm-hmm. as X, Y, Z. But you couldn't assign pricing to them. You couldn't assign a SKU to them because within those products in Zora were different objects that represented the actual product, the actual SKU. Oh, okay. So it doesn't work with standard product pr- products and standard price books in Salesforce where mm-hmm. you need to have SKU X and that has a price or it has, you know, five prices and five price books. books yeah. We had SKU X and it didn't compute to another SKU. Huh. Okay. Well, and it's an interesting, I do think that coming into scenarios like this, right? I've only been um, at uh, Cirrus for about six months. And um, I think it's important, especially uh, coming from my last job, there was somebody who came in and kind of questioned things in a very mansplainy feeling like why did you do this and i think it's slow and aggro right well and 
it's like I try to assume that you did the best you could at the time with the resources and time and money that you had, right? Or the features that you had, right? To your point, just now we're getting contracts with contract line items as out of the box options with Salesforce billing, right? I haven't looked into it, but as that example, right? There there may be something Salesforce has now built that makes it silly that you built all this custom stuff over here, or that maybe replaces the need for you to buy a tool. Not that the Salesforce tool is always the cheapest or you know, the, right. the right fit. Exactly. But, um, you know, I, we probably did it that way at the time because it made sense or because that's all the time we had or because that's the way I knew how to do it my first year as an admin, right? Not that it was the best, but... Um, Process builder. Right. <laughs> R.I.P. me. And as soon as you thought you were getting... Right? That, there was a time when that was the new th- great thing. That was the, that was the cool and thing. And now we're, now we're one of the next new great things. Hey there, we seriously had a lot to say about build versus buy. So we decided to cut this into two parts. So thank you so much for uh, tuning in to Serious Insights and stay tuned for the second half of the episode coming soon. Thank you everyone for listening to another episode of Serious Insights for Admins. Don't forget to get your 14 day free trial and free yourself from the drudgery of manual data entry. Start now by visiting cirrusinsight.com. That's cirrus, C-I-R-R-U-S, insight.com. And I'll see you next time.